First Peter chapter three. I want to talk this morning about hindrances to prayer. Tyler, my message, what's the hold up? I mean, you done prayed, prayed. Hey God, what's, what's the problem here? How come it ain't working? And why it's taking so long? So there must be something hindering it. Or I prayed something wrong. Or maybe I prayed something right and I can't understand or un- uh, hear the answer to it. Maybe because I'm not developed enough to hear an answer. I can ask a question but may not be able to get the answer until I grow more. It's like a child can ask for a motorcycle at three years old. They can't drive it, but they can ask for it. Drive you crazy till they get it. Now, if you train that, train that child from a very small child, they can be a motorcycle champion at 15 years old, but they have to be trained. So the title of this message tonight, excuse me, this morning, is what's the holdup? Hindrances to prayer. Now, Peter in chapter three is talking about the duty of wives and husbands, about how we should react to each other. And he says uh, here in uh, verse six, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Now I've used that on Kathy many times. I said, why don't you call me Lord woman? She said, when you do what Abraham does, I'll call you Lord. That's fair. Whose daughters you are, as long as you do well and not afraid with any amazement. Then verse seven, likewise, ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife. So your wife is not just your slave. Or your uh, helper, you have to honor her as unto the weaker vessel. Now, ladies, that doesn't mean you're weaker in mind, because I don't think women are weaker in mind at all, by no means. I think a lot of times some women are smarter than men. That's not the issue. But usually most men are stronger physically than a woman. And as being heirs together of the grace that's favor of life. Now, notice this last statement is where I want to pull out that your prayers be not hindered. So when he said that your prayers be not hindered, there is possibility that your prayers can be hindered. So God's telling us something. You can pray and something's hindering that answer from coming to pass. So what's the hold up? How many of y'all, well, uh, sometimes you've been waiting on God too long on some prayers. Let's just be honest. Come on. Okay, let's deal with that today. So let's, let's deal with that. So what's the hold up? Hindrance is the prayer. He said that your prayers be not hindered. Write this down. There is something wrong if we sow much in prayer and bring in little reward. Let me say it again. There is something wrong if we sow much in prayer and bring in little reward. In other words, you got this conversation going on. You're praying a lot, but the reward of what the answer to that prayer is not coming forth at at, at the time frame that you need it. See, you you have to tell God that when you're praying, especially concerning needs, if that need is time sensitive. See, a lot of people say, Lord, bless me financially. But they didn't say they needed it yesterday. That's a time sensitive need. Say, Lord, I need to know something. I got to have a time frame on this. This is a time sensitive need and I need to speak this to you, whatever it might be. Let's say you want to buy a house and you don't quite have enough money for the down payment. And now you're going to close and you got to have some money for down payment or something. And you're going to say, this is time sensitive. But if you don't say that, then the Lord, then you open up to let the Lord bless you in any way, shape or form. And he don't mind. But you see, you are also in authority on the earth because he gave you the planet. The he- heaven, even the heavens are the Lord, but the earth has he given to the children of men. And then you got to understand, you must have, you, you must be fully aware that something can hinder that prayer. Now, he said that your prayers be not hindered. Let me write, uh, write it down again. There's something wrong if we sow much in prayer and bring in little reward. Well, maybe this is a, 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 a hindrance here. Write this down. If the word of God is not a delight or your heart is filled with more love for yourself. Let me say it again. If the word of God is not a delight or your heart is filled with more love for yourself than God, your prayers will be stopped short of the throne. Now, I know that's a long sentence, but I'm going to say it again. You see, because there's, there's, there's a condition you have to meet so that prayers will not be hindered. Number one, if the word of God is not a delight or your heart is filled with more love for yourself than God, your prayers will be stopped short of the throne. Look what he says in Psalms 37 verses Four and five. And, and I'm, I'm going to go through this. You may just go to see the scriptures later, but um, uh, I want to give them to you. Psalms 34 verses four and five. It says, I sought the Lord and he heard me 
and delivered me from all my fears. Psalms 34, verse 4. Oh, excuse me, Psalm, that's Psalms 34. I want to read Psalms 34, verse four. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked unto me and were lightened and their faces were not ashamed. Now go to Psalms 37, verses four and five. It says, delight thyself also in the Lord and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy ways, verse 5, unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Now, let's just be honest. You want your prayer to come to pass with an answer. Is that correct? Well, maybe the reason why it didn't is not because you didn't do something wrong per se, but God is not a delight or you love yourself more than you love the God that you're praying to. Let me say it again. If the word of God is not a delight or your heart is filled with more love for yourself than God, your prayers will be stopped short of the throne. But if you don't want them to be stopped, you must delight yourself, therefore, in the Lord and commit your ways unto the Lord. That's Psalms 37, verse 5, verse 4 and 5. And of course, verse, uh, Psalms 34, verse 4 says, I sought the Lord and he heard me. Now, why could that man say that? Because he committed himself and delighted himself in the Lord. See, I realize when I pray, why am I praying this prayer? Is it because I want it or is it because God wants it in me? What's the hold up here? I've had people say, you seem to get your prayers answered quickly. Well, what I constantly do is be in his will. If I delight myself, why do you like going to church so much? Oh, let me help you. I delight myself in the Lord. I commit my ways. Why do you preach so much? Why not? I'm doing the work of the Lord. So it's a pleasure to me to be saved and a pleasure for me to work, even though I get tired sometimes and I look like walking death sometimes. I know that, you know, but I am going to die young at an old age. You hear what I'm saying? It don't mean that what I look like. It's what's going on inside of me. And the reason why I get a lot of my prayers answered quickly, I delight myself, therefore, in the Lord. And everything I've ever done, if you look around here, I have always put God first in my life. I built his house. I built his ministry. I did it when other ministers and tax attorneys and CPA say you're not taking enough money. You're not doing it. Me and Kathy didn't care. We set ourselves aside and said, Lord, your will. And then I never forget it. When he told us last year, he said that you have built my house. You have built my work. Now build yours. So we're going to build our house. And I'll tell you what, it's going to be beautiful. And it's going, it's going to make Judas jump up and down. Which is all right with me. See, let me say it again. There's something wrong if we so much in prayer and bring in little reward. If the word of God is not a delight or your heart is filled with more love for yourself than God, your prayers will be stopped short of the throne. So that's one hindrance to prayer. Do you really delight yourself in the Lord or is it a struggle to come to church? Do you just got to make yourself? That's okay to crucify the flesh because there's no good thing in the flesh. But after a while, your heart gets kind of sick. Are you willing to put the saints, the New Orleans saints, ahead of God's agenda? Well, I lost a few right there. Is it more important to watch a Super Bowl than it is to go to church? That tells you something. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not being critical of the people that are going to watch the Super Bowl because I'm watching myself. That's not the issue. But If I got to put God second to that first, I will not do that. Oh, now I'm going to make some of you mad. Are your children more important to you than your children's spiritual education in church? Or you prefer them to be at a baseball game or because they want to be there because that satisfies the flesh? Or is their spiritual education and spiritual nutrition more important than that? Y'all ain't mad at me, huh? I'm just asking a question. I'm not criticizing you. I'm finding out where is that delight? What is more important? Think about that. Number two hindrance. Sin discovered in the heart and unconfessed before God remains a barrier to prayer or a hindrance to prayer. Sin discovered in the heart 
and unconfessed before God remains a barrier to prayer. How do you know that? Psalm 66. Let me read it to you real quickly. Psalm 66. Are y'all enjoying this? Now, I don't want you to be, I don't want you to feel downtrodden on this, but this is going to answer why some prayers are not answered or not, not, or hindered. Psalm 66 verse 18 says, let me get to it real quick. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. What is iniquity? It's not sin. It's just something starting to twist. You know where we get wicker furniture? Wicked, wicker, twisted. You ever notice wicker furniture? It's twisted. You see, things began to become twisted in your life. God says in Psalm 66, verse 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So sin discovered in the heart and unconfessed before God remains a barrier to prayer. Go, over, go with me right now to Isaiah chapter 59. I told you I'm going to run you across some scripture here real quick. And you can go over that, but I'll read it for you. Isaiah 59, and you can study it out later. That's why this should be a series. But uh, Isaiah 59, verse 1 and 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you and he will not hear. Did you get that? What's the hold up, Lord? Do we have some secret sin that hadn't been confessed and repented for in our hearts? I'm not talking about in your head. If you get an ugly thought in your head, that's not a sin. What? Uh, let me get, help me, Lord. Oh, if all of a sudden the devil tells you, uh, go see some pornography. You think, oh God, that's a sin. No, no. You, you say, that's not my thought. My thoughts are lovely, just good, report and peer. You bring that thought into captivity through the obedience of Christ, you kill it. Amen. How you do that? By casting down imagination, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. You see, because all I'm going to do is bring you trouble. So let me say it again. Sin discovered in the heart and unconfessed before God remains a barrier to prayer. So if there's iniquity and sin that hadn't been confessed and repented over, that puts a hindrance to your prayer. Which means it's a black spot in your beauty. It may not be completely stained through and through, but there's a slight stain there. What's the hold up, Lord? These are some of the hindrances to prayer. Now, I could preach hours on this, but let me go to the next one here. Number three, nothing should take the place of God in your heart. Why? Beware of idols. What do you mean idols? Idols may take the form of fashion, friends, business, or self. Let me say it again. Nothing should take the place of God in your heart. That is, you have to understand that. Idols may take the form of fashion, friends, Business or self. Want a scripture for it? Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 3. Now, let me do a little preaching first. I get funny after a while. Ezekiel 14, verse 3. Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of at all by them? Do you see that? How can a fashion become an idol? You spend more time on your clothes than you do talking to your God. You're more concerned about your business than about God's business upon the earth. You'd rather go see your friends than go to, to the friend of all friends, God Almighty. <laughs> or you just prefer yourself. That was one of my problems. What? I preferred myself. That's before, I, before I was saved, I loved Jesse Duplantis. Why? I knew nobody going to help me. Kathy said that me and Kathy fell in love with the same person, Jesse. <laughs> That's true. I will admit to that worldwide. Because in my mind, I told that woman, I ain't talking three minutes after I married her. I'm walking out the Holy Rosary Catholic Church. I looked at her and said, let me tell you something. I'm going to play music. You follow me or you stay here. It may no different to me. You do what you got to do. She said, here's 17 years old and I'm 20. Man, I was ambitious and I did very well. But thank God that she loved me over my foolishness. She didn't argue with a fool because it confuses people. They don't know who the fool is. 
Never argue with a fool. Because people say, who the fool? See my point? So there was no room in my heart for God because there was no love there. I had consumed it all. Trying to make a living. And that was the excuse. Well, I got to make a living. I got to make a living. But between her and the Holy Ghost and Jody, they began to break down that shell. So let me say it again. Nothing should take the place of God in your heart. Idols may take the form of fashion, friends, business, or self. Ezekiel 14, 3, son of man. These men have, have set up their idols in their hearts and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of at all by them? In other words, my Lord, why are you talking to me? Because the great God you serve is one of those four or one of those three. Do you see my point? Those are hindrances to prayer. It's something more important than God Almighty. That is, I want to tell you, if you want to shut down a prayer, that's the number one thing that would just destroy you and beat your brains out. You have to put God first. That doesn't mean you can't, let me help you. That doesn't mean you can't miss church. You don't, you don't want to get so legalistic, good Lord Jesus, that you can't breathe. We got so legalistic years ago, a woman couldn't put makeup on her face. We had some ugly women in our churches, but that didn't stop adultery. That didn't stop fornication. And let me tell you something about you Muslims. I don't care how much you cover that woman. You still got men saying, one of what's on there. <laughs> you cover her from her head to her toe. Stick just enough for her to breathe with her mouth and something to see. And they got men going, one of what's underneath there. <laughs> you know it and I know it. You got to have a change of heart, not a change of clothes. Yeah. See, that's what changes people. A change of heart, not a change of clothes. Now, clothes communicates an attitude. If your clothes is so tight, And some guy says some sexual thing. Why did he say that? Look at yourself. You got a sign. Hey. And if you so sexually crazy as a man and somebody, some women don't want to be around you, look at yourself. Because all they see in this, all you want me for is to be used. You ain't concerned about me or even could, you could care less about me. See, it works both ways. So, Nothing should take the place of God in your heart. Idols may take the form of fashion, friends, business, or self. See, I have to be very careful with business. Do you know I'm a good businessman? Ooh, I love business. I love taking something that don't work and make it work and make it profitable. I like that. The Lord said, be careful. That's a weakness in you. After a while, you say, you know... <laughs> I'm doing this for the Lord. How many times I've had people say, you need to get involved in this. This will help your ministry. I said, no, it won't. This will help you. Let's just cut to the chase here. See, I, I realize that you got to be very careful. Not that you can't do business. I don't want you to misunderstand that. But you can't let it be consuming to the point that it takes away what God called you to do. Now, some of you men are called to business to finance the kingdom of God. That's a fact. So my Lord, you may want to do some other thing, but you ain't called. So stay where you are. I know one particular man I'm saying right now, he quit his job. He quit. I mean, he was a smart business man, became a preacher. The worst thing he ever did in his life. First, he done lost two churches. He done beat up. Finally. He said, what's the problem? I said, you're out of the will of God. But I want to preach. I said, that's OK. I know you want to preach, but you're not a pastor and it ain't going to happen. You're better in business. Notice when you're in business, people are getting saved when you just witness to them in your business. Yeah. I said, you can't only get anybody to come to your church anymore. You know why? Because you're not called. Go back to doing business. Finally, after 15 years, he went. Guess what he's doing? People coming in his stove barn, God, to get them saved. But I wanted to do this. I said, there's a lot of things we want. That's not the issue. But you wasn't called. The Bible said he called some. He didn't say he called all. He called some. Now, everybody would like to be a part of that some, but that's not our business. That's God's business. Okay. Ready? Let's go to the next statement here. The desires of our own pleasures strangle multitudes of prayers at times. The desires of our own pleasures strangle multitudes of prayers at times. James chapter four. Go with me to it. If you can, or just write it down. You can go with, you can go, uh, uh, 
when you study it out. James chapter four, verse three. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. Let me say the point again. The desires of our own pleasure strangle multitudes of prayers at times. Why? You ask amiss, James 4 verse 3, and receive not because you, uh, you ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. Now you see, ladies and gentlemen, you've got to be very careful. Why are you asking what you're asking? Is it for your own just pleasure? And God don't mind you having pleasure. But if you don't want hindrances to prayer, and that's why I'm preaching this morning this way, because how many of you have had prayers hindered? Let's just be honest. Come on. The whole church. We all have. Not that we're bad people, but a lot of times it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. It's not big stuff. But a lot of big tragedy happen. Some people kick into things. But a little fox is like a termite. He will eat your house down and you don't even know it's happening. Until the inspector comes. The exterminator, like they call it. So let me say it again. The desires of our own pleasure strangle multitudes of prayers at times. Write this down. These petitions are right when we ask for wisdom, power, and grace concerning these things. In other words, when you ask about something, you ask in wisdom, in power, and in grace to make sure that nothing will be hindered because you're asking out of the heart of God. And he don't mind you asking for your desires, but your desires and his desires are really one and the same when you truly understand each other. Let me say it again. These petitions are right when we ask for wisdom, power, and grace concerning these things. So I've had a lot of people say, you seem to be blessed because I always check my heart. Years ago, years ago, oh God. Let's see, how far is 1974? This is, uh, uh, right, what's something? <laughs> I thought when you got saved and everything that you, make a long story short, I find when you got saved, I thought you had to be poor, but I found I couldn't do nothing for the poor and I couldn't do nothing for God. So I knew that wasn't right. But I always liked watches. I wanted a Rolex. I always had a Timex. But it kept on ticking. You could put it on the camera and run it through a desert and it still tick. You could drop it from <laughs> whatever. But I just wanted a Rolex. I wanted the big brother Rolex. So one time in my prayer, I said, Lord, give me a Rolex. He said, yes, you little flesh creature. Gave me a Rolex. Called me a little flesh creature. Nothing wrong with the Rolex. But I desired that more than I desired God. All I could think about, Lord, see if I could just get me a Rolex. Because when you're raised, when you, when you pull white trash, when you've lived in a trailer all your life coming up, when you've had hand-me-downs handed down so much that the, the hand-me-down is already wore down. So after a while, some things become very important. See what I'm saying? And somebody else always had to wear your clothes before you wore them. Didn't your brother wear that? Shut up. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. But I knew my brother didn't have a Rolex. I didn't know anybody had a Rolex. So I asked the Lord one time. I just said, I was barely saved, man. I said, Lord, you have a Rolex? He said, yeah, little flesh creature. What I should have been saying was, Lord, he, Rolex ain't nothing to God. He got streets made out of gold. There was somebody preached some years ago, would Jesus wear a Rolex? It was a shot against prosperity. I guess so. He wears a gold crown. What makes you think he wouldn't wear a gold watch? But what time would it be? There is no more time. Time ceased. So he wouldn't wear a watch. Okay? See, that was a petition not asked to God, but not in wisdom. Nothing wrong with the Rolex. Not in power and grace. But I never forget the day that the Lord gave me a Rolex without asking him. Somebody walked up to me and gave me a Rolex president. Man, I was a fine one. I was, Lord, why? why? He said, now you have power and grace. You're no longer a little flesh creature. And I wore it, I don't know how long, and I felt led of the Lord to give it away. Now, when I first prayed for one, you couldn't, have put, you couldn't have took that off my arm with a cement kicker. Da, 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 da. You wouldn't have got that off my arm. All of a sudden, it wasn't as important as I thought it was. I said, well, I sold that. And I did. And then I sold another and another. I think I've given away Jesus. I have fine watches. Don't misunderstand. Lord, because I've sold it because you know, now I own them instead of them owning me. See my point? Mm -hmm. 
Steadfastness concerning your goals is essential in answered prayer. Write that down. You have to be steadfast concerning your goals. Why? Because it's essential in answered prayer. How do you know that? James chapter one, verse six and seven. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavered is like the wave of the sea driven with the wind and toss. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. God says, I'm not giving solid things to unsolid people. A double-minded individual that's tossed to and fro. You see what I'm saying? Let me say it again. Steadfastness concerning your goals is essential in answered prayer. The reason why we were able to build this nonstop Now, you ministers, listen to me and not struggling to pay for it. Didn't have all the money when we started by no means. Didn't even have maybe had maybe 10 percent of what this place is worth or what it costs to build. If that much, 10 percent. God honored us because we were steadfast. We had a goal. We had a mission and we would accomplish it. I had a man ask me during the building of all this. What happens if you run out of money? What you going to do? I said, stop. Oh, well, you're not going to go to the bank and borrow money. Nothing going, nothing wrong with going and borrow money. But I read a scripture. Now, this is for me. If you don't want to do it, you'll be in it. Oh, no man, anything but to love him. I owe no man nothing. Not, I'm not bragging on that. Nothing wrong with borrowing money. Don't misunderstand me. Nothing wrong with borrowing money. They got institutions. It's okay. It's, it, you should. There ain't nothing wrong. But for Jesse Duplantis, I look at that verse like I look at salvation. Believe with your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus rose from the dead. You shall be saved. I saw it. Oh, no man, anything but to love him. Uh, How am I going to live in a world of economy because the whole economy world is on borrowed money and it's good financial sense to use other people's money, but never borrow money on a depreciating asset. I'm getting into business here. I got to watch myself. If you want to borrow money, borrow something on an appreciating asset, not a depreciating asset. But it's okay to borrow money. It's okay. The banks here in in New Orleans said, do you need us? No. Why? Because my constitution, I accepted it the way God wrote it. Don't feel bad about that because the devil will use that against you. No, no. But see, that takes development to reach like that. I had to start out. I borrowed money before. I want to make everybody know that. I mean, I borrowed on my my first house and my second house. Yeah, I borrowed. I, I did. There ain't nothing wrong with that. But I said, God, can I develop myself? He said, can you? Yes, I can. And me and Kathy said, we ain't borrowing no more money. Nothing wrong with it. And I'll tell you this much. If God told me tonight, go borrow a billion dollars, I'll do it. I don't care. Why? Because I'm doing what the Lord said. People say, well, I thought you said you wouldn't borrow money. Well, that's what I said, but the Lord said do it. See, I, 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 I don't back myself into a box. But I have realized that owing no man nothing is nice. Very, very, very nice. (laughs) Y'all enjoying this? Which leads me to this statement. There is no stability about a wave. Then I say that, let him ask your faith, nothing wavering for he that wave. It's like a wave to see driven with the wind and toss. There is no stability about a wave. It's a creature of mere circumstances. A wave can be a blessing or it can kill you. A tsunami can kill you or you can have a surfboard and make it a sport. Not a tsunami, but I'm talking about, well, some of these guys ride 50 foot waves in Maui. How they do it? I don't know. You got to be crazy. But well, the difference between me and them is I have fear and they don't. Or do I have wisdom? I wonder which one it is. (laughs) But I'll tell you what, when I see them come down that crest, I think, my God. Look at this kid. Well, you know, he, he didn't learn that the first day. He probably started out in the bathtub with his rubber ducky. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. There's no stability in a wave. Now, you know what that means to me? There's no stability in the economy. There's no stability in Wall Street. Why? 
Because you're buying stock. What do you mean? Because the guy selling to you thinks it's going down. The guy that's buying it thinks it's going up. Which one are you? See my point? So I'm saying there's no stability. But all but there is stability in God's word. But how many times we got on God's word and we had our surfboard, but we fell. We crashed. But you know, a real surfer, my brother, uh, my son-in-law, Eddie, Eddie's a surfer, man. I didn't get into that stuff. Stay out there all day long. I mean, man, I'm pretty sure he's crashed. I'm pretty sure he's hit the ground and eat sand, get his brain beat out. But you know what? He gets back up on that board and go out there. He's asked me, Mr. Eddie, you want, you want, me, to, you want me to teach you? <laughs> no. I'm going to watch you, Eddie. Go ahead. Enjoy yourself. <laughs> No. Now, when I was his age or when I was real, real young, oh, oh, Lord, I did all that kind of stuff. Well, I never was a surfer. I got to say that. But, you know, them, whatever the little flat boards that you throw out there, I can't think of it. All that. As many water sports as I could. Kathy met me at a swimming pool. I was a lifeguard. Do you see what I'm saying? But, man, and it's not that. We say, what? you want me to be honest? Why won't you go out there? I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, mm, don't think so. Now, I don't mind going to sit in snow up to here with a grizzly bear looking at me. But I got something looking at him. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? That's a whole other ball game there. One of my directors, Michael, had got him a beautiful deer the other day. Now, most people wouldn't like this at all. I'm probably going to get some animal activists. Here we go. Now, I went by his office and he went like this. Showed me a picture, man. I said, oh, I stopped. Look at the rack on that deer. Man, he even took a picture of it hanging up down before he skinned it by an eight foot ladder. Look how much, how big that deer is by the eight foot ladder. Just long. I said, yeah, that is a fine deer. Now he, you got a good hunter going to be cold. He's going to be cold, but he don't care. Because when that deer step out there, you start sweating. Everything becomes limber in your body. You may even shake. It's called buck fever, which you means you're about ready to miss. <laughs> How many hunters know what I'm talking about? You're about ready to miss. But if you can calm yourself and think deer sausage, <laughs> chili, steak, you're going to bring home some meat. <laughs> There's no stability, by the way. It's a creature of mere circumstance. Let me go to this other one. Write this down. The lack of honor to one another is a major barrier to prayer. The lack of honor to one another is a major barrier to prayer. Whew. First Peter chapter three, verse seven. Likewise, ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. You know why sometimes me and Kathy's prayers didn't get answered, Kathy? Because I didn't honor you. I just told you, follow me, woman. I ain't gonna lie, I say it in front of everybody. And do you know why some of my prayers did not get answered, Kathy? Because you didn't honor me. We were both bumping. So see who's gonna win first. But if we bring honor to each other, we're going to get something done. In this house that we're building, I turned it over. I said, Kathy, it's yours. I got to thinking, how many decisions? I don't want to know. I don't, I don't want to make a decision over a doorknob. I said, Kathy, it's yours. And I'll back anything you want. She came up to me. She said, you know, Jesse, there's certain things you want. Mm -hmm. That's expensive. I said, Okay. Well, we're going to need custom things here. I said, well, I think God put us in the right person with Richie Pichon. Richie do that because he's the one going to build it. So if you don't like that house, you blame Richie. Richie's the one going to build it. No, I'm just joking. Richie going to, but see, Richie understands that stuff. He can talk with Kathy. And now, and then we got the architect. They're going to get it all together. All I'm going to do is stand back and sign the check. That's my job. I take full responsibility. That's all I know how to do. See what I'm saying? But I'm going to honor my wife. I'm going to honor Richie. I'm going to honor that architect. See what I'm saying? Now, I don't know that architect as much as I know Richie. So I'm going to say, I'm going to do a side deal with Richie. Richie, this guy an idiot? I trust you, Richie. This guy's coming for a percentage. And that's okay. He needs to make money. That's not the issue. My point is, 
Richie knows if he says something, he can smoke me. But he ain't going to smoke Richie. And he ain't going to smoke Kathy. Why? Because they love blueprints. <laughs> Kathy, as a girl, they would cut the grass and they'd make blue little houses with the cut grass. You know, the clippings? Make floor plants. Okay, this is the house. I ain't never thought of that in my life. I thought, why would you want to play around with cut grass? Before I say it, I smoked a lot of grass. But I ain't gonna lie about it. I ain't like, I'm not like President Bill Clinton. I inhaled. I ain't lie. I took trips and never left my house. Oh, gone, son. I mean, I did it. I ain't gonna lie about it, but the Lord forgave me. Hallelujah. Don't look at me so weird. You've done the same thing. Most of y'all come out the 60s. The lack of honor to one another is a major barrier to prayer. Why? Agreement with one another is a powerful condition of prevailing prayer. The Bible said if two of you agree, that's Matthew 8, 19. Let me say it again. Agreement with one another is a powerful condition of prevailing prayer prayer. If you want to stop hindrances of prayer, you've got to agree with each other. Agreement with one another is a powerful condition of prevailing prayer. It has to be. I find when we get something done personalized, it's because me and Kathy agreed. If we have a great dinner, it's when we both agree. Concerns. Now she'll go eat where I want to eat or I'll go eat where she want to eat. But for years, I've always eat where she want to eat. I'm kind of turning that table now. I want to eat where I want to eat. And you know, she goes, I'm trying to lose weight. Well, just back off a little bit. Okay, don't be the Antichrist. Okay, I ain't gonna be the Antichrist. You want some cheesecake? <laughs> you know I do, you little devil from here. Come over here, I'm gonna cast that devil out. Yeah, okay. I'm just trying to be nice to the girl because I equate food with niceness. If I wanna bless myself, I don't know about you people. I don't know about you watching all over the world, but Americans equate food with blessing. If something good happens to us, what do we do? Let's go out and eat. I don't care if it's at McDonald's. We'll go out and eat. That's why America is the fattest nation in the world. But that's all right. As long as we fat, you got a job. Man, we create an economy all over the world. Do you understand that? We equate, let's go out and have a nice time. If we want to relax, what do we do? We go out. If you take your kids to Disney World, they may want to ride a ride. You're looking for a hot dog. Let's find something to eat around here. Some kind of stuff. like You know, we equate relaxation and fun with food. That's why New Orleans is so, the food is so good. That's why the restaurants need to come back. Just didn't need to come back because people have to eat. And over here, we, you come over here, we don't care about how much butter is. We make it taste good. We pray over it and we swallow it. <laughs> Agreement with one another is a powerful condition of prevailing prayer. Write this down. When the head is lifted above the overwhelming circumstances, the life and prayer is answered. When something's looking at you and you think this is, I cannot cross this. I can't get over this. Let me say it again. When the head is lifted above the overwhelming circumstances, the life and prayer is answered. Psalms 3. Let me read that to you. Psalms chapter 3, verse 3. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of mine head. You see, God will make you look for beyond what you're believing for right there. Because see, you're looking at direction. He's looking at destination. You see what I'm saying? Let me say it again. When the head is lifted above the overwhelming circumstances, the life, the life and prayer is answered. So how many of you may, you may have a financial trouble. You see, you're just looking at this. If I can just get this met. But God really wants you to look beyond that need to get met. He wants you to look at your destination, not just your direction. You see my point? When I was building this place, you know what the contractor told me? You know, I, you know, I bought the artwork for this place before I built the buildings. What? Huh? I already had that in my, he says, my God, just, you're the only man I've seen that. I said, yeah, because I already see it done. I learned that from an architect. I'm not good on blueprints, but I asked that architect, can you see this house built? Oh yeah, I can see, I can't, I can only see the picture of it. Not all the, the blue stuff. I just like the 
picture of it. That's what it's going to look like. See, Kathy, but not Kathy. She knows about a wall, move this wall, do this, do this, turn that around, do this, all that kind of stuff. You know, I said, is it possible we can have a house with no doors? I hate doors. Doors are always in the way. Go through them. You either open them up, close, boom. You got to get them around. I hate that. Kathy said, oh, yeah, we need doors, Jesse. I said, well, I don't, you haven't been in the bathroom and the doors, you got to, your butt's hitting the door and you're trying to close something. And, you, and the only reason you use those doors is to hang your suit on or a bra <laughs> hanging on the door now. Am I telling the truth? They're just aggravating. They're just hot there. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? They just hot I said, can we build a house with no doors? She said, Jesse, we need some doors. Well, what do we do? How, how do we build a house? I, I hate them doors. She said, pocket doors. Oh, yeah. Slide them in the walls. Uh, Richard, we're going to have some pocket doors. Because I, I don't like all that stuff. Lord, gee, you know, I want to put something on the wall and there's the door. Opens up, covers what you're going to put. I got that in my own office. I got something I want everybody to see. It's a Tabasco jar. I like Tabasco. And the head of the Tabasco company sent it to me. Right, Ricky? I said, Ricky, hang it on my wall. But the door... I'm the only one that sees it. I'm about ready to rip that door off that wall. <laughs> you know, I hate that door. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Lord. But I thought, Cassie, well, yes, we can have doors, just have pocket doors. Oh, that works. Makes sense. See, my head was lifted up. Kathy brought it up higher. I never thought of pocket doors. I didn't know what a pocket door was. When she said a pocket door, I thought, what is a pocket door? Then she showed me. Okay. When the head is lifted above the overwhelming circumstances, the life and prayer is answered. Now, let me, clear, let me say this in close. Write this down. Humbleness, not stupidity, of ourselves before God is what gets his attention. Humbleness, not stupidity, of ourselves before God is what gets his attention. First Peter chapter 5. Look what it says here. Let me hurry up here, First Peter. Y'all enjoying this? Amen. I just wanted to, so because you know, some of you people's prayers are not being answered. And this is, I'm giving you an answer to First Peter chapter five, verse oh six. Humble yourself therefore under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time. How do I humble myself? By casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. Let me say it again. Humbleness, not stupidity of ourselves before God is what gets his attention. So you humble yourself. You've heard the old Pentecostal statement, God go humble you. No, he won't. You're going to humble yourself. You have to humble yourself. And you do that by casting your care. Stay right there and go back up to James chapter four. Just back up a little bit to James chapter four. And look what it says here. James chapter four, verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. How many of you want to be lifted up? You humble yourself. If you're waiting for God to humble you, it ain't going to happen because he will not break your will. He gave you that will. And I'm going to say this, it's going to shock you. Do you know God can't save you until you give him permission? God Almighty. How many of y'all believe God's in control? Well, if he is, he sure got this place in a mess. I shocked you when I said that. He's not in control. He never came and rebuked Katrina. You know who rebuked Katrina? Me. The heaven, even the heavens are the Lord, but the earth hath he given to the children of men. We are in authority in this planet. But if we don't take our authority, who's causing global warming? Gorillas? No, are gorillas, chimpanzees, lions, which are stronger than we are, are they in authority? Who's in the zoos? Gorillas, chimpanzees, lions that could take us out, Ron, with one slap of his paw. We dead as a doornail. But they're not in authority. When will you take your authority? You people that don't believe in healing, will you please quit doing that? Because you're hindering a lot of people for being healed. Because God don't see us as a bunch of 
arms and legs. We're one body. Yes, made up of many members. But I tell you what, if my finger's hurting, my toe knows it's hurting. So why don't you just believe in healing for, for compassion's sake? Do you see my point? Humbleness is what God looks at, not stupidity. God is not, oh, I'm going to get a bunch of ugly letters. Let me, let me get down here. Who oh, he not in control, David. If you want to go get drunk this afternoon, you can. And God ain't going to stop you. Betty will kill you, but God won't stop you. <laughs> Betty will bust him in the head with a bat. Clint, if you want to go chase a woman this afternoon, you can't get to no, no, please. Go. <laughs> God wouldn't stop you. He would be telling you, don't do that, Clint. But small as Amarillas is, she'll beat your brains out, rip your head off, make your head a lampshade. <laughs> do you see that? Do y'all see what I'm saying here? He can't save you without you giving him permission. When will this church world and theologians see this? That's authority. Well, bless God. I taught myself something this morning. Hi, I've had my prayers. And when the Lord gave me, I said, I've done that myself. He said, yes, you have. And you was blaming me. <laughs> yes, I was. <laughs> I ain't going to lie. I said, Lord, how many times you told God, if you don't do this, I quit. You sound like a child. He probably said, go to your room. <laughs> At least you had one. We had one room at one time. <laughs> Me and my oldest brother used to sleep on a, man, we had a, we had a camper. And Daddy thought it was a house. This is way back when, before my, my younger brother or my sister was born. Me and my brother, we stayed in an eight foot wide, 32 foot trailer, like a FEMA trailer, you could say almost. And we slept on the floor. We were, we were poor, but Daddy did better. You know, we finally got us a place. But I tell you what, you know, as a kid, it didn't bother me in the least. Until another kid said, why y'all live in that trashy place? That never bothered me. Until peer pressure came in. Young people, let me help you. Why don't you set fashion? Let me some of you young guys, young ladies. Why don't you set fashion? Why you got to look like everybody else? Why don't you just be unique? And that's okay. Because I'm going to tell you something. There's something good in you. You got God in you. You can, be, you, you can have the world start going to your fashion instead of you going to their fashion. You can really do that. Why? Because you are in control. You are in authority. You really are. That's why I never put down your children. Never do that. Because I want to tell you something. God created them to rule and reign in life by Christ Jesus. So tell them there ain't nothing they can't do. And be proud of them. And if they make a mistake, forgive them. And, oh, and let me help you young people. Sometimes the reason why your mama didn't give you the call, your daddy didn't, didn't give you the call, there might have been some hindrances to your prayer. <laughs> got my, ah, you got the revelation right there, didn't you? I just worked fine, didn't it? Why ain't that old man doing it? Why he ain't do this and all that kind of... Well, there may be some hindrances. But if you find out where the hindrances are, your dad will be proud of you. Your mom will be proud of you. And if you build trust in them, you're going to get that car. You're going to get everything they got. They'll do everything they can to be a blessing to you. Did you enjoy it this morning? Give Jesus a hand clap for that. Hello, everybody. I'm Jesse DePlanis, and I'm so happy you're watching this video today. If you're enjoying our channel, please subscribe. You can hit the bell to get notifications as each new video is posted so you don't miss a single one. Then you share this video to your friends, your family, so they can be blessed by it. And I mean, as I said, they'll be funny, they'll be hilarious, and I promise you, if you watch it, by the end of it, you're going to feel good because I believe in bringing joy into people's lives. I mean that sincerely. And I tell people, say, does anything ever wipe that smile off your face? No. And thank God I got good teeth. Praise the Lord. So watch it and subscribe today. Thank you. And keep watching. You'll be blessed.